Hello, and welcome to this Microsoft Build session. My name is Rady Amaser, and I am a product manager on the Windows IoT team. Today, I'm excited to talk to you all about a new feature that we have for IoT Enterprise, and that is called Dual Operator. I'll start by giving you a brief overview of where Windows IoT Enterprise falls within the Microsoft IoT portfolio. From there, we'll talk about how this capability is positioned to work with fixed purpose devices that run Windows IoT Enterprise. We'll then walk through the capability as well as the projected user experiences and the supported scenarios that come with the various types of input. And lastly, we'll take a peek at how it all works under the hood and how you can develop solutions that will enable this capability for IoT Enterprise. So let's start by talking about where Windows IoT Enterprise falls in the IoT stack, especially since this capability is unique to just this operating system. Windows IoT Enterprise is a world-class solution in the Microsoft IoT portfolio. Microsoft's IoT portfolio is made up of two parts, the intelligent cloud services that are powered by Azure and a whole host of devices that empower the intelligent edge. Windows IoT Enterprise is a part of the intelligent edge that supports MPU class devices. Now diving a little deeper, you can see that there are a wide variety of devices that run IoT Enterprise, from connected solutions to essential devices. There are gas pumps, kiosks, medical devices, voting machines, and even industrial machinery that run the Windows IoT operating system. These devices can be classified as fixed purpose as they are locked down for a single application. Because Windows IoT Enterprise has such a large set of devices that are fixed purpose, we offer many features and capabilities to create a lockdown environment. These features include assigned access, multi-app kiosk mode, keyboard filter, along with other policies that are central to how the dual operator capability will function on devices. This is why this capability is being introduced to Windows IoT Enterprise exclusively. We already have a portfolio of uh, solutions and operations that go ahead and configure your devices to be in this lockdown fixed purpose state that we will ensure that your experience is seamless. So let's get to it. What is this dual operator that I keep talking about? Well, it's an incredible capability and we're very excited to showcase this to you as it's been a demand from our ecosystem and our partners for quite some time. OEMs can go ahead and build a Windows IoT Enterprise device with dual input and dual monitors that have an interactive experience for two users who will simultaneously use the device with two in-focus applications. So if you think about this, you can actually have a couple different scenarios that might come to mind. The ones listed on the screen are of a point of sale device where you have a cashier on one screen and a customer on the other, and they often will be you know, doing different types of input to go ahead and process their payment. Maybe one's on touch screen, maybe you have a cashier who's using a keyboard, but essentially there's two screens and there's two actions happening simultaneously. This can also be done in a medical setting where you have a patient interface on one screen and a doctor interface or maybe a, a hospital administrator interface on the other side. The idea is that the combinations and use cases for dual input are endless and we really encourage you to go ahead and find other offerings and other ways that you can go ahead and use this capability. So let's talk about the enablement and how you can actually get started with using dual operator. Today, we have a licensing agreement that goes ahead and allows you to have two users simultaneously using a device. Traditionally, Windows Client is a one user, one device type of model, and we are shifting that for only fixed purpose devices that run Windows IoT Enterprise. As you can see, we have updated our licensing language as of December of 2021 to go ahead and support this capability. It says a single customer may be locally and simultaneously interacted with with up to two end user operators. And of course, to assist with the enablement of this capability, as there is no inbox code, but instead we are leveraging everything that's already built into the OS, we have an open source sample that we'd love for you to go ahead and review. This open source sample consists of about three parts. The first is a sample Win32 application, the second is a UWP application, and the third is the dual operator utility itself, which is orchestrating the whole capability. 
We also have supplemental documentation that goes ahead and showcases a lot of the information that I'll be covering in these slides to showcase how you can go ahead and set this scenario and capability up for your solution. We also have a demo video, which I encourage you to also check out, showcasing this capability in action. And you can learn more and check out this open source sample at aka.ms slash dual operator. Let's walk through the user experience for dual operator and how a solution integrator can go ahead and orchestrate a solution to support this capability. The open source sample consists of three parts. The first is the command line utility dualoperator.exe, as well as two associated applications, the Win32 and the UWP. The dual operator utility here is a more main orchestrator, and it takes in the configurations that the solution should abide by, and it needs to know which applications and what are the respective inputs of that application. This utility relies on the raw input API and the winuser.h functions, which we will go ahead and review shortly. We also have two applications that showcase how different types of input are being received here. So if you look at the Win32 app number one and the UWP application number two, you see that they look identical because they have the same components. The first component being buttons, which go ahead and showcase a touch or mouse input. Then you see the second piece, which is a text box, which could be for input of a touchscreen keyboard or a USB keyboard. And then finally, we have a freeform area at the bottom, which could be potentially used for a signature or maybe a picture that could be done by your finger for a touchscreen or even a stylus. Next, we're going to jump into the command line utility, which is going to showcase how you can take in parameters set by the solution integrator for the desired experience. This really involves specifying the application, the type of input application it's receiving, and if there's any associated device ID with the type of input peripheral you, of your choice. The screen capture showcases some of the combinations that can be applied. There's a lot more combinations, I can assure you of that. But let's go ahead and take a look at state three and what state three has available. So state three has application one, which in this case is a UWP application. It is taking in input via a USB type of device. And then we have application number two, which is going to be a Win32 app, which has an on-screen keyboard. And that is the input of choice. So the way that a user will go ahead and actually invoke this type of configuration is by selecting the dual operator exe as its utility. It'll go ahead and select app number one and the location or file path for application number one and state that it's a USB type of input. In this case, they went ahead and included the GUID for the USB. And then it went ahead and set up application number two's experience, which again gave the file path for application number two and specified the USB type, which in this case would also be um, for a touchscreen keyboard. So by going ahead and setting that up, you're setting up an experience that now the application knows exactly what type of input is it's looking for. So if you look back at the top, we have a whole list of different parameters that this utility will go ahead and take in. And essentially, this is setting up the configuration for how this whole scenario should be. We have pieces called list at the top, which will go ahead and showcase all the various 16 states that this uh, utility can go ahead and provide, as well as what application number one needs, application number two needs, the different types of input, and then lastly, how touch works. Touch capture, specifically no sending, which means that you don't want to send it to the application itself, will go ahead and tell us that we don't need to move forward with that. So touch is a very important part of this whole entire experience. And we'll cover the complexities related to touch screen input in a couple more slides. As you can see, we have two fields for touch. The first being touch capture no send and the other being touch capture send, which means which application and where in the application do you want the touch to be sent to or the touch input to be sent to. So as you can see, it's a little bit more involved as you go ahead and set up the experience, but once you know exactly which peripherals you're going for and exactly which applications they should route to, it's a pretty smooth ride. So now as we focus on the user experience that we're trying to bring from this capability, um, you can go ahead and take a look at the picture, which will help hopefully go ahead and illustrate some of these components. So input from user number one is running application number one, which is displaying on monitor number one. And that's all highlighted in blue. 
And then we have input from user number two, which is running application number two and displaying on monitor number two. And again, the crux of this whole thing is that it's running only on one Windows IoT Enterprise device box compared to running two different boxes or having completely different scenarios that then have to interact with each other. We're trying to bring everything into one box and have two applications running simultaneously so two users can go ahead and use a single Windows IoT device. So now we're going to get a little bit into the nitty gritty and really under the hood to understand exactly how we're making this magic happen. So we have some applications which are supported, which I kind of mentioned earlier. We have a Win32 as well as a UWP. Um, we are allowing one Win32 and one UWP as well as two Win32 applications to be simultaneously run. So there are two important APIs that are integral to making the magic happen with the solution. The first is a raw input API. And this API is responsible for the USB peripherals and the on-screen keyboards and making that functionality work. Then we'll go ahead and take a look at the register pointer input target function, which is a part of the winuser.h class, which will go ahead and help orchestrate the touch input that comes in with the solution. So now, when you go ahead and leverage these APIs, as I mentioned, they're used for two different types of input styles. So your raw input is really going ahead and defining that input source, whether that be the keyboard, the mouse, the touchscreen keyboard, and the API will respectively direct the input to the specified and designated application. And specifically, it'll go ahead and ensure that it's being redirected properly. And that's the, the API that we're going to go ahead and leverage for these types of devices. Commonly today, this is actually used um, in HID macros, if you're familiar with that. I'm not sure if we have some flight simulator fans. Um, but essentially, that same remapping of keys and remapping of functions is what is relied upon for raw input, specifically of this Win32 API class. Next, we have the register pointer input target function, which is a mouthful to say, um, but it's really used in Microsoft's narrator service, which is actually how we discovered it. Uh, we did a hackathon not too long ago, um, I, I believe last fall, where we actually work with folks from the accessibility team who use this API and actually use this type of classes quite frequently to go ahead and set up different types of services um, for folks that are going to need enhanced experiences when it comes to Windows client. So really, when we went ahead and took a part the narrator service, we understood what was actually happening. And that was that they have a boundary on the application itself or on the Windows shell itself and are able to go ahead and redirect any of the input that happens there um, to then be registered uh, by the application before it actually hits the OS input stack. So rather than actually hitting, you know, a browser, uh, for example, the narrator service will tell you that you're hitting the browser and the action won't actually happen. So this redirection when it comes to touch is an integral part of the solution, just like the redirection that happens with raw input, which is again making sure that any of the keyboard uh, strokes or making sure the touchscreen keyboard touches that you're doing are being registered and redirected properly. So essentially our raw input and our register pointer input target function are there to go ahead and ensure that our types of input peripherals are being targeted um, and also redirected to the appropriate application. So that's pretty much the first component of this. So now that we're redirecting, I feel almost like a conductor when I'm doing this as we're starting to orchestrate a solution together. And really what is helping us orchestrate or almost conducting the solution is the user32.dll. And now what this does is it goes ahead and actually looks at what's on the input stack. And our command line utility will tap into this DLL to figure out and filter what various inputs we're looking for and what the OS is seeing and how we're able to filter that out. So for example, if our input is being targeted for an assigned application, so I'm only looking for all keyboard input, we can go ahead and ensure that's flagged and then given the authority to go ahead and act. Oftentimes, um, there might be an accidental touch screen touch or there might be a mouse click that wasn't specified for that application. And because that is not specified by the utility itself, it will go ahead and be ignored. So essentially, we're listening in. We're making sure all the right functions are happening as a conductor and will, as a result, appropriately act. And the application will appropriately act to make sure that we are good to go. But before we get excited, I'm sure you guys are thinking, but Riddy, what about focus? How are we going to go ahead and make sure that two applications are not bouncing back and forth as a user decides to you know, click on one screen or do a touch screen on another? Well, this is what brings the beauty of Windows IoT Enterprise into the picture. 
We have a lot of fixed purpose devices, and there's a whole talk about that in Joe Coco's session of the Windows IoT Roadmap and Overview, as well as in the security sections. We have a lot of different features that go ahead and build Windows IoT for what it is. So as I mentioned, the fixed purpose uh, solutions earlier in this presentation, assigned access, keyboard filter, those go ahead and actually put into frame how these devices are being used today. So we envision our OEMs using Shell Launcher V2 or multi-app kiosk mode to really fit this experience. And what that really means is that this application is going to be full screen and it's going to be locked down in an environment. When you are going ahead as a user to potentially use this, you might be doing it at a cash register, you might be doing it at a doctor's office where there's already one application that you're focused on. Unfortunately, when you're going shopping, you can't open up you know, the Internet Edge browser and, and start to go shopping. You really have a lockdown experience from the get-go. So this is why we're focusing this capability to be targeted for fixed purpose solutions. Essentially, this also helps us from an engineering perspective, as both, both applications being in full screen, we know exactly where the inputs are being targeted. So we know if it's happening on monitor one versus monitor two, which again helps us isolate these two experiences. And with the applications in full screen, you're not getting that browser back and forth or that big you know, gray bar tab um, bouncing back and forth because you are in a full screen mode experience. So with that, let's talk about our supported scenarios and how you can use a dual operator utility to go ahead and bring to life some of the solutions that you have depending upon the input styles of your choosing. In our supported scenarios, we have two matrices here. And before we jump in and look at exactly which types of input you should use, pay attention to the types of application styles that are being used. On the left, we have a UWP application and a Win32 application. And on the right, we have a matrix C that shows the various input styles for both Win32 and another Win32 application. And overall, the command line utility logic will go ahead and ensure you that if there are any unsupported solution scenarios, that you're not necessarily going to be able to configure it. But because this is an open source solution, we're more than welcome to go ahead and have you investigate and hack into it to see if you really want to go ahead and make it work. The sample that we provide today will only be able to provide the solutions that are supported, but we really encourage you to help us develop and build this capability further. So now taking a look at a UWP and Win32 matrix, you have the ability to go ahead and pick and choose some supported scenarios, as well as showcase which are some of the unsupported scenarios. As I mentioned, we want you to go ahead and see what works for your scenario, and maybe you can contribute to the open source GitHub sample if that is something that you're looking to actually configure. For example, if you decide to use a Win32 application with a USB peripheral, you can't use a UWP application with touch buttons, as that solution is not necessarily supported. However, there's many other options for how you can make touch buttons work, as well as USB peripherals work. So we encourage you to go ahead and look at the matrix or hack the matrix to make sure it works for your solution. Again, um, we have focus in here as well um, to go ahead and showcase to you on the back end really what application is in the foreground versus in the background. Um, the utility as a whole will go ahead and manage that for you um, since both applications will be in full screen. But in case you're curious, um, that is what's happening in terms of the focus aspect of things. We also have a very similar table or matrix structure for two Win32 applications. Now this has more supported scenarios, but we still do not necessarily offer two touch keyboard offerings at the moment. But again, you're more than welcome to hack it up and let us know what you find. We're very excited to hear from you all. But in the end of the day, we really want you to go ahead and, and leverage these functionalities in Box, especially if you decide to use the Win32 applications as you have a plethora of different things to do. All of this documentation will go ahead and be provided at our GitHub link, as I mentioned earlier. But hopefully this walkthrough was helpful for you to go ahead and understand how to use a dual operator capability today. And with that, we'd love for you to go ahead and give dual operator a try today. The link is aka.ms slash dual operator, and we'd love for you to go ahead and try out the open source sample and for you to share the various customer solutions and scenarios that you've unlocked with this capability. If you're interested in learning more about the Windows IoT platform and the amazing features that our team has developed, we really encourage you to go ahead and check out some more build sessions. We have one on our roadmap, on our security, on Kubernetes, especially some other offerings that we're going ahead and putting together uh, for our comprehensive platform. So we really encourage you to go ahead and check it out if you're interested, and we really hope that you have a wonderful time at Build.
So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and we look forward to getting your feedback. Have a wonderful Microsoft build.